Have you ever had the feeling that you felt God was angry at you? That he was out to get you? Have you ever had a really bad day and just thought, God, what is going on? Are you upset at me? Uh, years ago, my wife and I were serving in Kentucky, and we had a situation happen where in the course of one week, the plumbing in our house backed up, which meant we were basically homeless at that point. You, you just can't survive in a house with four boys where the plumbing backs up. Our, both of our cars ended up in the shop. And, and there was just a moment where I had a, a job to do, I had stuff to do, and I didn't have a, a really a car or a house. And I had a wife and four kids, and I'm like, Lord, what's, is everything cool you know, with us? Is everything okay? Um, sometimes we have a bad day and we think such things, and, and sometimes it goes a little darker. I've served in a, a number of different churches, and I've had diff in different churches where I've served in, different people come to me with different things, and it sounds kind of like this. Uh, I had a, a lady uh, years ago that came to me and said, uh, David, can you pray for my uncle? He just found out that he is dealing with cancer. And I said, well, absolutely, I'll pray for your uncle. And I just said, how's he doing? Is he a believer? That's something I always ask. And, and she said, yeah, he's a believer. But he made this statement that really concerns us, and this was the statement he made. He said, God is now getting me for all of the bad things I did when I was a teenager. I just know God's getting me for, for all the bad stuff I did years ago. It's catching up. Uh, maybe it sounds similar to a mentor of mine years ago that when I was over at his house for breakfast, I was asking him what you ask when you fellowship. I was just saying, what's God doing in your life? How's everything going? He said, well, everything's going pretty well, but I got to be honest with you, I, I get scared a lot. And he said, I just get the feeling that if I miss a day where I don't have a quiet time, that God's going to take my wife and my kids from me. And I thought, are you kidding me? Really, you really fear that, that God's going to maybe kill your wife and children if you miss reading the Bible? He said, yeah, I don't know why I feel that way, but I just have that feeling about me. Have you ever had a, that fear, even as a child of God, that maybe God's upset, maybe God's angry, maybe he's just going to zap me? Maybe even though I know I'm his child, but if I do something wrong or do something a little off, he's just going to zap me and, and take care of it. I want to deal with that fear from God's word as we study the one word sermon this morning. We're going to study the word propitiation. This is a word that instructs us on God's anger. And if you have your Bibles with you, I hope you have them open to Romans 3. This is a very critical word that every believer should know. It's a word that I stress for parents to teach your kids. It's a word that's in the Bible. This isn't a seminary word. This is a biblical word. It is a word, by the way, that, that is only present in Scripture. But it does highlight an action that happened in the Old Testament. If you're ever going to take a word that's difficult, what I like to do is find the simplest definition I can. The simplest definition I can. So I've given you a three-word definition of propitiation that if you have your notes, it's right there in your notes. Let's go ahead and define it. I will illustrate it numerous times before we're done. But to define propitiation, it's this. It's a wrath-removing sacrifice. I also put in brackets there, wrath-absorbing sacrifice. And as we are trying to understand the cross, every time we've observed the Lord's Supper, uh, I've been trying to look at just words, words that show up in Scripture, that once we understand those words, they give us a, a better understanding of what happened on the cross, and they help, help us as we, of course, observe the Lord's Supper, as we uh, seek to be obedient to the Lord. It, it fuels our knowledge of what God has done and His love for us in the cross. And of course, this word shows up right here. In chapter 3, verse 25, God presented Jesus, him, as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. You, you know what's going on in Romans in chapters 1, 2, and 3, all the way up to these passages, God, through the apostle Paul, is telling us we're all guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty in sin. Chapter 3 tells us that we're all uh, horrible sinners. We're all in desperate need of a Savior. It's worse than you could ever have imagined. We are depraved human carcasses. As you read chapter 3 in the first 18 verses, and it says there, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's no one who even seeks God. Everyone has turned away, and all alike have become useless. This is God's word, again, speaking of sinners, all of us. 
And it goes into the sin that, that we all have. And you read three and you're thinking, well, we're, we're done for. We're, we're in trouble and there's no way out. And Paul shares the way out right here in chapter 3, verse 21, and where he says, but now, apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed as attested by all the law, all the prophets, all the Old Testament, pointed forward to this truth that is that God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is salvation in Jesus Christ to, to all who believe. You can turn and trust in Christ. And then he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but they are justified freely by his grace. Justified again means just as if you'd never sinned. They are declared righteous. They are made clean by the grace of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God has provided an escape for sinners through his son Jesus. And God presents his son, verse 25, as a propitiation. Well, what is a propitiation? It's a wrath-removing sacrifice. As we unpack this word, a full understanding of propitiation will lead you to, number one, see the sacrifice that has been made. If it's a wrath-removing sacrifice, if we're going to unpack the word, we need to see the sacrifice that has been made. All throughout the Old Testament, sacrifices have been made. When you read Hebrews, it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So there has to be blood shed. The very first sins committed by Adam and Eve that we read about in the book of Genesis includes the very first sacrifice. It's in Genesis 3.21. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. In Genesis 3.21, very briefly, you'll just see a very quick verse. It should be up on the screen here. It says, The Lord God made clothing out of skins for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. There they were, caught in their sin, and God killed animals to make a covering, to cover them, to provide a covering of their shame. And that was the very first sacrifice in the Bible to cover sins, pointing forward to the sacrifice of Jesus himself to cover our sins. Later on in Leviticus 16, an atoning sacrifice was required for Israelites during the days of the tabernacle, and the blood of goats would be sprinkled onto the, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. There were three things that would happen in Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement. The first thing is that the high priest would have to sacrifice an animal on his own behalf to cover his own sins, symbolically. Secondly, he would take a goat, kill the goat, and they would take the blood of that goat and spread it out and sprinkle it on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Some of you remember the Ark of the Covenant. You've seen maybe the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know where the, the lid, where the angels kind of bend in their wings to one another. In the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, the high priest would go in there and would cover that lid. That's what we also call in the Bible the mercy seat with the blood of that goat. And then there, there was a, another goat involved called the scapegoat where the high priest would place his hands on the head of that goat and symbolically the sins of the people would be transferred to that goat and the goat would be sent out of the camp out of all of the Israelites to go and to die. And all three of those pictures of, of what goes on are fulfilled in the cross. They're fulfilled, they point forward to Jesus and they have very strong symbolism as you study them because Christ fulfilled all of them when he came and sacrificed himself on the cross. Christ fulfilled all of the requirements of the law when he died on the cross for our sins. This shows up right here in our text. It says in verse 21, but now apart from the law, God's righteousness has been fulfilled, attested by the law and the prophets. Everything you read in the Old Testament points forward to the need of one who would come and die for sinners. And so do you realize this morning that someone has died for you and for your sins? I remember being in high school, a brand new Christian, a friend of mine named Bob Heinley. He didn't know yet uh, that you, you weren't supposed to witness to all your teachers. He did that. I was, I'm kidding. You, you're supposed to witness to everybody, but all of us other Christians were too scared to do it. And Bob, brand new Christian, we're in band together. He's a French horn. I'm a trumpet. We're standing next to each other. Our band director comes up. It's the middle of practice. And Bob looks at my band director, Lee Ponder, and he says to Lee Ponder, Lee, if someone died for you, would you want to know it? And he stopped. It was very awkward. He just looked at him and said, well, yeah, if someone died for me, I would want to know that. I, would, I definitely would want to know that. Bob reached in his pocket and pulled out a tract and said, I want you to read this. This will tell you about how God loves you and sent his son to die for you. Would you read it? And he took it and read it. And Bob, right there in band practice, witnessed to our band director. Just like, who does that? You know, it was awesome. It's awesome. 
Do you realize today someone died for you? Jesus Christ came and died a death that you and I both deserve, stood in our place and took the hit that should have hit us and died. He was the sacrifice given for us. Well, what really saves a person? As we get into the second part, I want to really explore this word a little further because the second point here is study the wrath that was absorbed. If propitiation is a wrath-absorbing sacrifice, what is this wrath? What is it? As you read the Gospels and read the Old Testament, you'll see that Jesus speaks in the garden of this cup that he is to drink and to take. He says there in Luke twenty-two forty-two, Father, if you were willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, it's not my will, but yours be done. And, and so as you do a study on the cup, you find in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, there's a reference there of a cup. And Jeremiah 25, 15 says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and make all the nations I am sending you to drink from it. And you see throughout Jeremiah this imagery of this cup of wrath, the wrath of God towards sinners like you and like me. And then in Revelation 16, verse 19, it says, This great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered in God's presence. He gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fierce anger. As Jesus came and as he wrestled in the garden, it wasn't so much the fear of dying on the cross that gave him that great fear. The fear was taking the very cup of the wrath of the Father and drinking it. And as he hung on the cross, we know that he drank from that cup every last drop, turned the cup over and said, it is finished. And he breathed his last and he died. And that is a cup, by the way, that was meant for sinners. God is angry because of our sin. He's a holy, righteous, and just God. He cannot be in the very presence of sin. But in his great wisdom displayed on the cross, he is able to be righteous and to to declare righteous those who put their faith in Jesus. He's still able through Jesus and the death on the cross to remain a righteous God. And it is a great mystery. It's a great mystery. I know as I share some of this, in a room of this size, there has to be someone in this room that says, that's just absurd. You're telling me that divine child abuse is saving Christians. That is the, the exact picture the Bible gives us of what God has done. And it sounds insane. It, it is hard for us to, to grasp. As you read in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6, look at these words and see if you can come to any other conclusion but that. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But, but he was pierced because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Christ on that cross extinguished and absorbed all of the wrath of God for our sins. He bore it in full on the cross. And because he bore it in full, there now remains for you and for me in Christ no more condemnation, no more wrath for us as Christians. And I'll show you that here in a moment. Look at John 3, 36. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. So God's wrath rests on every sinner. But by faith in Christ, that wrath is diverted. That wrath is absorbed in the cross. And you have a question that you will answer with your life for is, where is the wrath going to go for you? Are you going to remain in God's wrath? Or are you going to trust in the sacrifice God provided through Jesus and by trusting in him, see that wrath be diverted to the cross. Either it remains on you or it remains on the cross. And so how are we to, to understand and grasp the word propitiation? Let me, give, let me give two Florida illustrations that I think might help. Uh, propitiation. In propitiation, if you're going to understand the word, something has to die for something else to, to live. So one idea that I've thought through as I've wrestled with this word and trying to illustrate it is the space shuttle, which I realize we don't have the space shuttle program anymore, but we all know the space shuttle. We remember that program. I remember going to see the shuttle when I was in third grade when it landed in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I was a a young boy, and I got to go and see 
uh, up close, not too close, but the space shuttle. I remember looking, we got close enough where you could see the little porcelain tiles. I don't even know what I'm talking about. They, the space shuttle has this heat shield that's full of all of these porcelain tiles that are able to heat up. And as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, uh, hundreds of those little tiles are destroyed. But because those tiles on the heat shield are destroyed, all of the astronauts inside of the space shuttle live. And they're able to return. And so that heat shield and those tiles become, for the astronauts, propitiation. They absorb the wrath of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And they allow the astronauts to live. It's one illustration. kind of helps. Uh, think of another one, Florida one. I remember coming to Florida years ago, and my son, uh, Eli, he's our oldest child now, but he was really young at that point. And we had a little kiddie pool that we had filled up in my, the backyard of my parents. And my son was very excited about swimming in that pool. I remember he got out in it, and I was looking out, and I realized the sun was in full bore. And I thought, did we put any sunscreen on him? And no, we didn't. We didn't have any. We, we could have driven out to the store. I wasn't about to pull my son out of the pool because he was loving it. He was having fun. But I decided to do this. I decided to put on a hat and to wear some like, long sleeve clothing and just kind of stand out there over the kiddie pool and let him play in my shadow. That's what I was able to do. And as I stood over there and enjoyed watching my son Eli play in the kiddie pool, uh, the few skin cells that were showing... <laughs> And we're receiving the, the sun's wrath, absorb the wrath. But my son didn't get a sunburn. The, those skin cells became the propitiation for my son. I guess those skin cells died. If we really want to illustrate this well, though, a person has to die. And so one dark illustration that I did think of, and I, I want to thank David Gutierrez for working through this one with me. And I think, David, this was your idea, but this, was, this is what we were discussing when we talked about the word propitiation. We hear those stories and read the tragic stories when a tornado comes through and devastates entire towns. And usually you will hear and read of a, an account of someone heroic, maybe a mom that tried to shelter her children. And in sheltering her children, the tornado killed the mom and the children were able to live under her care. And she took the wrath while her kids were able to live. That, that, that gets us close to what Christ did for us on that cross. When he died on that cross, he took the wrath that you and I deserved. And it's because of his death that we are able to live. He bore the wrath out in his body in full. He's our propitiation, the, the wrath-appeasing sacrifice for you and for me. That's what propitiation means. It wasn't the nails that went into his hands, really, that saved us. It wasn't the crown of thorns that saved us. A lot of people throughout history have died on crosses. Some Christians that died on crosses sang as they were being crucified, and Nero set many of them to fire to light the, the, the way of the path. So it wasn't the nails or the crown of thorns. What saves us is he took the wrath of God. And that is the moment, the mysterious moment on the cross, when God the Father looked down and placed our sins on the Son, and God says, God the Son says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a great, great mystery where our sins were placed on the Son. But as you look at that, that is the love of God for us. And so that leads us to the third final thing. We get to stand in the confidence of a full pardon. We get to stand in the confidence of a full pardon. Look at Romans 8.1. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. No condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. There is no wrath, no judgment coming for those in Christ. Romans 8.31, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Or who is against us? And so you and I don't have to play those mind games anymore. When we have a bad day, we don't have to sit there. If we're a child of God, we know we've put our faith in Jesus. We don't have to sit there and wonder, does God really love me? Or is he just, is he angry at me? And to the man who said this, uh, I just know now that I'm dealing with cancer that God is getting me for all of the bad things I did when I was a teenager. You know what propitiation says to that man? No. God got his son, Jesus, for all those things you did as a teenager. God loves you and is pouring out his love to you through his son, Jesus. To my friend that would say, I, I miss my quiet time. I'm scared God's going to take out my wife and my children. God took out his own son so that he wouldn't have to take out you or your wife or your kids. 
We can know in faith, because of propitiation, that whenever we have a bad day, it's not God's anger. But anything that comes to us really is God's love. And that's why James was able to say this. He could say, I consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. James was able to say, any trial that comes our way as a child of God, we were able to consider it as joy because God's at work. And so wherever you're at, if you're going through a rough time in your life, yes, I'll admit God could be using that to discipline you, but it is not out of his anger. It's not because he's trying to get you. It's out of his love. If you ever question that God loves you, I would encourage you to read Romans 8 over and over and over and over and see the great love displayed for you through the propitiation of his son on a cross for you and for me. Let me pray for us. As I pray, I'm going to, uh, before I pray, let me say this. I'm going to be inviting up our deacons in just a moment to assist with the Lord's Supper. As they're making their way, I want any visitor here to know that we open, we practice an open communion. We allow in this church, if you're not a member of this church, we allow you to participate in communion in the Lord's Supper where you may have made a decision for Christ elsewhere. Uh, we just ask, though, that if you partake with us, that you, yes, have put your faith in Christ, and secondly, you have been baptized as a believer in, in a church of like faith. And if that matches up for you, then we welcome you to join in on the Lord's Supper. I know the last time we did observe the Lord's Supper, I made a statement that angered a few. I said, if you have unresolved issues with anyone else in this room or anger in your heart, I want to encourage you not to partake of this. Uh, I want to explain why that is. Jesus warned about this. He says, if you have an offense against your brother, leave the altar and go and, and clear things up with your brother and then come and pay your vows at the altar. This is one of those refining moments as a Christian where we get to rededicate ourselves to Jesus Christ. And if there is still something anger unresolved in your heart towards someone that you have not been able to, to go and, and to make right or Maybe someone in your heart you've not forgiven. I, I want you to take care not to drink and eat judgment on yourself. This is one of those meals we partake in as Christians where we reflect on the forgiveness that's been given to us. And God says we are to forgive others as we in Christ have been forgiven. And so all that we gather for, all that this is about in Christ is forgiveness. And if we're harboring anger and unforgiveness towards someone else, we need to fix and, and deal with that. The next Lord's Supper we have, I'll be preaching on that. But I want to encourage you to, to just understand the context of that. I know there may be people in your life you're upset at, and maybe you've tried to, to satisfy and, and get that fixed as best you could. The, the Bible says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. If you've made those attempts and there's been no reconciliation, you can partake. If you've not made any attempts at all, and there is an anger and hatred in your heart today, please deal with those things uh, before you eat and drink of the Lord's table. Let me pray for us as I pray. Uh, our deacons will come and gather, and then our musicians will come and, and make themselves ready. Let me just offer a prayer. Father, I'm thankful that you bore into your Son all of the wrath towards my sin. Your Word tells us that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those being saved, it is the very power of God. While I'm aware some in this room may look at the cross as utter foolishness, Father, we look at it as seeing your power, your majesty on display. We thank you that Christ bore our wrath that we deserved in his scars on that cross. And that through him, we can have that relationship with you. We can have eternal life. Father, we can have the joy right now in that personal relationship with you. Lord, as we observe this Lord's Supper, I pray that you would be the witness of these things, that if there's anything in our hearts, any wickedness, that you would search us and try us. See if there's any wicked way in us and lead us into the way everlasting. And, and may our, our heart and mind, Father, offer up uh, just a sacrifice to you right now. That if there's any sin that, that you would have us deal with you in this moment, we would confess it to you. We would repent from it. And we would recommit ourselves and rededicate ourselves to Jesus. Bless us now as we observe the body and blood of your Son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.